Wow. Well, I just want to start by praising God and thanking the worship team for being here and thanking you for the last, what, two plus years doing this over video, coming in, recording it ahead of time. That was a blessing to us. But this is way better. This is so good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, praise God, we're here. It's so great to be with you all and to be with you all in here in this space together. Um, the elders have told me that since we're all in the AC, I can preach twice as long. So uh, <laughs> you think I'm joking, but uh, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. <laughs> let's, let's pray real quick. Dear Lord, God, uh, we are thankful. Um, God, please forgive us for taking for granted the blessing that it is to gather together in person. And we thank you that we're here today. And we just pray that we are edified, that we're built up, that your word will pierce our hearts, God, um, and increase our joy in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it is Palm Sunday, but I'm not actually going to talk a whole lot about Palm Sunday. Um, one of the main reasons is we've been going through the book of Matthew as a church together. And so only a couple months ago, Pakusa preached on Palm Sunday. And so if you want to learn about Palm Sunday, if you want to hear a sermon about Palm Sunday, you can go back and find that. Uh, it's great. Um, but I want to start today with a question. And the question, you might have seen it in the bulletin. Um, the question is, what would you say if someone came to you and said, here is love. This is love. I found it. That thing that everyone's searching for. I found it. Here it is. Would you believe them? One of my favorite authors, or probably my favorite author, other than inspired scripture, is uh, Victor Hugo. Right? And in his most famous book, Les Miserables, he had a, had a line early on in the book, and, and it sums up, I think, a powerful truth about life in general. He says, the supreme happiness of life is the conviction that we are loved. Loved for ourselves, say rather, loved in spite of ourselves. And if you've read the book or you know the story, you've seen the movie, the, the, the musical, uh, his book is full of characters who are looking to be loved. And very few actually find what they're looking for. Uh, one of the most well-known characters is a, is a woman named Fontaine. And in the musical, based off of the book, she sings this tragic song that kind of captures this longing to be loved. She says, I, I dreamed a dream in times gone by. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> When hope was high and life worth living, I dreamed that love would never die. But the tigers come at night as they tear your hope apart, as they turn your dream to shame. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. Some of you, maybe many of you, maybe all of us, can identify at least a little bit with Fontaine. You've longed to be loved. You've searched for it. Maybe you found the man or the woman of your dreams. You thought you had found it, but only to wake up one day and they've, they're gone. Maybe because they've left you. Maybe because death took them away. That love has let you down. Or maybe you thought when you finally had a child, here was someone who would love me, someone who needs me, someone that I can pour my life into. But as the years go on, you come to realize that all your hopes of being loved are far too heavy for your child to bear. Right? 
They disappoint you. You disappoint them. They take you for granted. Maybe they leave. Or maybe you've put all of your effort into work. If I just work hard enough, if I just attain a certain level of success, then I will get the love and appreciation that I've been so longing for. At some level, we're all looking to be loved. And at some level, all of us have been let down and disappointed. And we deal with that disappointment in different ways, right? Some of us just give up and we kind of build a wall around us. We self-protect. Some try harder. Some lower their expectations. So again, I want to ask the question. If someone comes to you and says, here is love. This is love. It won't let you down. It is sure. It is certain. It is indestructible. I've found it. Here it is. What would you have to know about that love in order and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins? John is saying, are you, are you looking for love? Are you wondering if such a thing really exists? We need to look no farther than the cross of Jesus. That's what John is here to tell us today. And I'd guess that most of you here could tell me the story of the cross, right? This is the beginning of, of what's known as Passion Week, right? And most of you probably could share many of those details of what happened, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe you've heard sermons kind of detailing in graphic detail the physical suffering that Jesus faced as he was being tortured and hanging on the cross. Or maybe you've thought and pondered about the emotional and the spiritual pain that he endured on the cross. So you can, you can tell me what happened, probably. But can you tell me why it happened? And can you tell me why it had to happen the way that it did? That's what I want to look at today. I want to look at what was going on behind what was going on. What is the why behind what happened? And, and obviously there's so many things we could talk about when we talk about the cross, right? But one of the things we must talk about when we talk about the cross is love. Right? Love is at the very center and heart of what the cross is about. So I want to spend some time unpacking this this morning for us, understanding this divine love. And the first thing we see from 1 John is that God's love is a love for the loveless. All right? Or to put it another way, God takes the initiative to love. He's not loving us in response to our love for him. This was God's idea. He didn't meet us halfway. He took the initiative. He pursued us. He did everything necessary for us to experience his love. Before you and I had even the faintest glimmer of affection in our hearts for God, he loved us. He set his heart on us and determined, no matter the cost, to love us. He didn't need us on his team. He wasn't under any obligation to love us. He wasn't lonely. He didn't love us because he found something lovely in us or attractive about us. Martin Luther put it beautifully when he, he said it this way. He said, the love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. All right? What he's saying there is that God doesn't find what is beautiful and decide to love it. He makes beautiful whatever he decides to love. 
This is love, not that you have loved God, but that he has loved you. But not only did God take the initiative to love us, before we'd ever even considered loving him, he loved us while we were against him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you call yourself a Christian, this idea, this, I mean, it's in the Bible, right? <laughs> we, we believe this. We confess this. But I'm not sure that all the time what we confess with our mouths and, and even understand in our minds has really sunk down the way it needs to. And I, the Apostle Paul understood the difficulty of this truth, right? That's why one of the first things he says to his apprentice, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, is this. He says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. I don't know if you knew this about the Bible, but all Scripture is true and trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, right? So why does Paul feel the need to say that? Like, that's assumed, Paul. We know that. Okay, but he specifically says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I think he says that because he knows it's hard to believe. It is hard to believe that God saves sinners. And what's even harder to believe when we're honest about our sin is that God saves sinners like me. I used to spend a lot of time trying to convince people like you how horrible you are. <laughs> like, like, I felt like it was my job as a preacher to make people understand just how horrible their sin is, right? And, and, and yes, it is part of every believer's job to speak the truth, lovingly, boldly, if necessary, and to call sin what God calls it. But I can't make you feel it. I can't make you feel the weight of sin. Only God can do that. And he does. I mean, just last night, I, I was in a small group, and, and someone was sharing, and as they were sharing, they totally went off script because God was putting on their heart just the weight of their sin. And there's just this beautiful time of public confession and rejoicing in the grace of God and how he's worked in this person's life. And it was wonderful. But I can't orchestrate that, right? Only God can do that. And if God is working in you at all, you're already aware of your guilt and your shame. And the more you start to see the glory and beauty and the holiness of God, the more aware of your sin you're going you're gonna to become. Which then creates another challenge. When we start to awaken to the reality of our sin, we start to ask the question, if this is really how sinful I am, and God sees it all, and he knows my worst thoughts and the things that I do in the dark, how could he ever really love me? I think one of the reasons we don't deal honestly with our sin is because we're too afraid that if we were honest about how sinful we really were, God couldn't love us. So my goal has, has changed from trying to force you to admit how sinful you are to freeing you to admit how sinful you are. Because the gospel is frees us. The gospel proclaims to us that it's safe to 
to admit our sin because God knows the worst about us and he loves us still. God doesn't love us in spite of our sin even. He loves us because he came into the world to save sinners. Even and especially sinners like you and me. Listen, God knows you better than anyone else. And he loves you more than anyone else. But this now creates an even bigger problem. Have you seen it? Let's look at just a few things that God has said about himself in his word and see if you can start to understand the problem that we have here. All right. Let's look at Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. He says, The Lord, the Lord, who will by no means clear the guilty. Or later in Proverbs, it says, He who justifies the wicked and who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Or Psalm 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. And this is just a few of the verses like this in the Bible. Are you, are you seeing the problem? Are you starting to see the problem? It, this is the greatest problem. This is the most important question in all of reality. And this is it. If God is good, and he is, and if his goodness demands justice, which it does, and justice demands that evil be punished, then how can God forgive me and still be good? What do you call a judge who fails to uphold the law? Call them incompetent. What do you call a judge that can look the other way for a little bribe? Call them corrupt. What do you call a father who discovers his children have been being abused and he knows who, de who did it and doesn't demand the full weight of justice against the abuser. I call that a bad dad. If God is a God of justice, he cannot just casually forgive the lawbreaker. If God is holy, he can't be in fellowship with evildoers. If God is love, he must hate those who oppose that which he loves. If God is good, he cannot love what is wicked. A God who is not angry at sin is not a good God. Do you ever stop and think about the fact that our greatest problem is that God is good and we are not? The fact that God forgives sinners is a problem. And if you don't understand that problem, you don't understand the gospel. It's that serious. If God is angry at sin, which he is, and if I am a sinner, which I am, then how can God love me? This is the how. Back to verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John answers the problem of God's justice with one word, propitiation. And depending on your your translation uh, they translate that word in different ways some say atoning sacrifice or expiation um, but the meaning of the greek word is propitiation which means to placate to satisfy 
to appease God's holy justice. You see, from Adam and Eve, all the way through Abraham and Moses and throughout the Old Testament, God had been teaching his people that blood was required to cover sin. He'd been saying to his people, your sin makes me angry, but I will accept the pouring out of blood as a satisfaction for justice. But they kept sinning. And they kept having to sacrifice over and over again. And God was teaching them generation after generation that sin brings bloodshed. But the blood of animals will never be enough. You need a better substitute. And this is where, finally, we do have a tie-in with Palm Sunday. All right? We got there. Do you know what else was happening on that day? The day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem? That's the day in the Jewish calendar where the high priest would select the Passover lamb. The lamb that would be shed. That would cover the people so that God's wrath would pass over them. The triumphal entry of Jesus was the Messiah presenting himself as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. You see, the crowds may have thought that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to free them from the Romans. In reality, he was there to to meet an even greater need and to overcome an even greater threat. And this threat would have to be met with violence. Blood would be spilled. But it wouldn't be the blood of their enemies. It wouldn't be the blood of an animal. It would be his own blood shed to make peace between sinful humanity and a holy God. Jesus died for us. Yes. Amen. But even more importantly, Jesus died for God the Father. He died to satisfy, to propitiate the wrath of God. I like how uh, theologian Richard Phillips talks about the wrath of God. He says, God's wrath is his utter intolerance of whatever degrades and destroys. He hates iniquity as a mother hates the polio that will take the life of her child. Here, the wrath of God is linked to his love. Since he does not simply walk away in disgust from his fallen creation, God, in his love for his own work, is utterly irreconcilably opposed to sin, is resolved to stamp it out, and through his wrathful judgment is determined to cleanse the world for its holy destiny in the glorious return of Jesus Christ. I can still remember the moment where it clicked for me that the wrath of God is actually good news. It was my first year as a Navy chaplain. I was with the Marine Corps, and it was my job to take Marines who were returning from combat and do a little retreat with them and help them process what they'd experienced. And it was, it was intense. There was some intense stuff. But I remember sitting around a fire one night. And there was this Marine uh, who started opening up. And he, and he shared about how he grew up in the church. He had heard a small gospel about a small God who loved him. Because why wouldn't he love me? Right? I'm great. I'm awesome. Right? And he thought he knew God. He thought he knew the gospel. He thought it was just, oh, God's love. Great. And then he went to war. And he saw evil. He saw evil things being done to others. He saw himself do evil things 
to others. He was shaken, shaken to his core, and he, he just could not understand if God was good. How could there be so much injustice in the world? How could he care more about justice than God does? And I got the opportunity to share with him that the God of the Bible cares way more about justice than you and I ever will. That he will get justice. No sin, no evil will go unpunished. Vengeance will be the Lord's. And I thought that would bring him comfort because that was the issue he was wrestling with. But then something clicked. Well, if that's true, then how can I be forgiven? If God will get justice, ultimately, I know I've broken his law. I know I've done evil. What hope is there for me? And I got to explain this concept of propitiation, that yes, God hates evil, and God will punish evil, and God must punish evil. And every single sin that's ever been committed will be paid for. Either in hell, for those who are clinging to their sin, or it's already been paid on the cross as Jesus took the wrath of God for our sins, for all who trust in him upon himself, and paid the justice that needed to be paid. And I'll never forget this, this Marine, this big, tough, battle-hardened Marine just broke down. And God changed his life. And we wept like babies. <laughs> Because the gospel is good news. You see, when we start to understand the doctrine of propitiation, our understanding of the gospel begins to deepen and our appreciation of God's gracious love flows in. Right? Here's just, just three things we can say about propitiation and, and what it shows us. Number one, it shows us the immensity of our sin. Right? If you have a small view of your sin, you're going to have a small view of God's love. And the opposite is true as well. If, if you're struggling to see the love of God for you, maybe it's because his love for you isn't that great because your, your view of your own sin is not what it should be. You don't understand the chasm and how big it is that God had to cross in order to love you. Some might say that God's wrath is an overreaction to sin, right? Why is he so angry? I think it's because we fail to realize that what makes sin so horrible is not the quantity of sins that we commit as much as it is the quality of the person against whom we have sinned. All right, just a quick illustration, all right? Um, I have a pen, right? If I was to take uh, a piece of paper and just poke it and tear it, right, with this pen, big deal, right? Nobody's freaking out. I just tore my paper, just destroyed this paper. If I was to, to find a, a rock outside and scrape at it with this pen, People might think I'm weird, but nobody's going to freak out. If I walked over here and started scraping at the wall, okay, people are going to start to notice, right? I might be asked to leave. At worst, maybe they would want me to pay for the damage that I've done. If I walk over to you and I take your child, start scraping at her face, Now we're serious, right? Now I'm going to jail. If I walk into the White House and attack the president with this pen, I'm dying, right? I'm getting shot. 
Okay? It's the same action the whole way through. The difference is, who am I doing it against? That's what increases the gravity and the horribleness of the action. Every sin we commit is like trying to scrape at the face of God, the source of all beauty, life, majesty, the creator. Our sin is infinitely offensive because it's against the infinitely glorious God. Propitiation shows us the immensity of our sin, but it also shows us the immensity of God's love. Because at the same time that he demands justice, God then provides it himself. He provides it in himself. He sends his son to be our substitute to bear his wrath against us. You might have heard a, a preacher say, and, and I hate to admit, I've probably said things like this before, or we'll say like, well, God didn't give you justice. He gave you love. But the problem with saying it like that is, I mean, I know what we're trying to say, but the problem is that it, it creates this dichotomy between God's justice and God's love. It's saying that God's love is, is not just, is not righteous. And that's not true. God is a God of love and God is a God of justice. And in love, God has satisfied and fulfilled his justice. The propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus expresses both God's love and God's justice. It shows us God's love for his own holiness, that he's willing to destroy all who would stand against it. And it shows God's love for us, that he would stand in our place and bear that wrath. The cross shouts, this is what your sin deserves. And this is how much I love you. Enough to pay the full price for your forgiveness. Enough to drink the entire cup of the wrath of God down to its very last drop. The immensity of our sin, and at the same time, we see that God's love is far greater. Lastly, we see the security that God's love provides. If God had not provided the atoning sacrifice for our sins in our place, how would we ever be sure that we were forgiven? If our forgiveness depended on God's mood that day or how much we loved him or our performance, we would never be sure that we'd done enough. We'd never be sure that God wouldn't change his mind tomorrow. God, Jesus' death didn't potentially accomplish salvation. It secured it for all those who trust in him. The cross of Jesus shouts, it is finished. This is why Charles Spurgeon could proclaim when thinking about this passage, he wrote, I am a sinner, but there's no reason on earth or under the earth or in heaven itself why I should be sent to hell. My sin has been forgiven me, but what is much more than that, my Lord Jesus Christ has made such a complete atonement for all my guilt that it does not even exist as a charge against me. The debt is paid and the receipt is nailed to his cross. The cross shows us what our sin deserves, but when we look at the cross, we see someone else on it. And who is it that we see? see heaven's greatest treasure the son of god 
the only begotten, beloved Son of God. God's love is a love that gives the greatest treasure. What did it cost God to love us this way? It cost God everything. Again, let's look back at our passage. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. His most precious treasure If you're a parent, I want you to think about what you wouldn't do for your child. I want you to think about how much you love that child. Do you think the father loves the son any less? Do you think God the father is less of an affectionate father than you are? Again, we're getting into like brain splitting Trinity thoughts here, right? But whatever is meant by God the Father and God the Son and that des- description of that relationship, it can't be less than what human father and son relationship is. God the Father loved his son, and yet he gave him up for us. Let me ask you this. If God wanted to demonstrate his love to you, can you come up with a better plan? What more could he have given to convince you of his love than to offer up his greatest treasure, his only begotten son, on your behalf so that you could know him? If the very life of his son is not enough for you, then nothing ever will be. I want to say that Jesus came not kicking and screaming. He came joyfully to do the will of his father, to express the love of God in human form. To sinners like us. This is love. The love of the Father in sending his Son to die for us. The love of the Son who for the joy set before him willingly laid his life down. So, how are we supposed to respond to this love? Well, the call of this sermon today is just see it, behold it, soak in it, receive it, know it, believe it. It's the call of 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God has to start there with with seeing with beholding with tasting the love of God for you so if 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 you need to talk to somebody come talk to somebody if if you need to get alone by yourself today and just dwell on God's love for you do it do whatever you got to do if you need to repent of having a small view of God's love or having a small view of your sin, then do it. That's the call. But you might say, "Really? That's that's it. That's that's the whole point of the sermon is just just, just to believe." I mean, all right, I I get it. Okay, you should be able to walk away from a sermon on a Sunday with at least something practical, right, to do throughout the week, some some way to apply it. 
But if that application is not grounded in, flowing from, empowered by, and deepening our enjoyment and experience of the gospel of Christ, then it's a waste of time. It's not an application that's coming from God. Don't be so focused on figuring out what you're supposed to do for God that you rush past the beauty of what God has done for you. It has to start with receiving because you can't give something that you don't have. You can't call others to believe something that you're not seeing for yourself. But real quick, Let me tell you what's going to happen to those of you who are seeing God's love for you, who maybe have grown in your appreciation today and your understanding of just how much your God loves you. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to want to do something with it. You're going to want to show it. You're going to want to share it. Right? You're going to want to do the next verse. John goes on in verse 11, and he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If that describes you, beloved, if you know that you are loved, you're going to be compelled to go and love others. Because that's what God's love does. It transforms us. It moves us. It compels us to share that love with others. And you're going to go out and you're going to do that. And sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, you're going to realize that you don't actually love others the way that God loves you. You're going you're gonna to fail. And then you have a choice. At that point, you have a choice. Do I just say this whole thing's a sham? It's too hard. I can't do it. Or do you stop? Mind yourself of God's love, and do you realize that God knew you were going to fail, and he loved you still, and he died to forgive you of your failure to love the way that you ought, and as you meditate on that, your appreciation of his love for you is going to grow even deeper and even stronger. And it's going to compel and move you to go back out and continue loving. And you're going to fail again. And you're going to come back. And you're going to just have this glorious cycle of growing in your ability to love while you're simultaneously growing in your vision of just how big the cross is and had to be in order to love you. And as you do, the light of God's love is going to shine brighter and brighter into the darkness around you. God's word has come to us today to call us out from having a small view of God's love. Here is love that sees us at our worst. A love that doesn't minimize the horrible reality of our sin, but sees it and takes action to deal with it and to destroy it forever. Jesus knows the worst about you, yet he is the one who loves you the most and loves you the best and loves you truly. We need to be reminded of this over and over again. I need to be reminded. You need to be reminded God knows how easy it is to forget this. 
This is why he's given us reminders. That's what we're going to do right now. Communion is exactly that. It's a reminder, right? So that we'll always together be reminded of what our sin deserved. The shedding of blood, broken body, death. And it reminds us of what God did to save us from what we deserved. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance. Communion is a time where we come together as a community of humble, forgiven sinners. And we remind ourselves and we remind each other as we celebrate together just how much our God loves us. Take some time. Reflect on that. And after a few moments, Brother Mike's going to come up and lead us in communion. Mm -hmm.